worship our King together.
across this room today, we lift up our hands and we lift up our hearts and we speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus into this community and into this region and into our families, God. Father, I pray that your peace would come, that every aspect of who you are that we've sung about this morning, that you are our peace, that you are our provision, that you are our strength, you are our hope, that every aspect of who you are would be made manifest in your people in this season. God, we don't only long to come into your presence and seek it here, but we seek it in our lives. We invite the presence of the Holy Spirit and all of who you are to walk out the door with us today. God, you've been so faithful and so good. Thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives, and I pray that you would strengthen it and broaden it, that we would widen the place that you hold in this house in this community, in our hearts. And we love you today, and we thank you for your faithfulness.
Once known for thriving churches, spiritual revival, and the Great Awakening, New England has now become the most spiritually dark region in the United States. Portland, Maine, ranking as one of the darkest cities. The local church has gone from being the center of community to a landscape of white steeples and empty pews. And yet God's Spirit is doing a new thing. He's starting in His people. He's starting in the church. In recent years, God has brought a deeper understanding of His love a new hunger for His presence, and a renewed call for unity among the churches, especially the leaders. Right here in Greater Portland, pastors, ministers, preachers, and leaders have come together in humility to pursue unity for one common mission, making disciples of Jesus who impact our state, the state of Maine, for the kingdom of God. Leaders are recognizing that it's not through programs, buildings, events, or lights, but through prayer, repentance and fasting that we would see a powerful move of God here in this region once again. For us here at East Point, we're not simply a local church, but we desire to be an impact church, a church family whose influence and resources have the ability to impact individuals and communities all across the region. In this season, we've sensed God's specific calling for us, a call to come alongside local churches who have vision beyond their resources and who are committed to impact Greater Portland for the Kingdom of God. Through the development of the Kingdom Impact Fund, we'll be able to further foster unity in this region, resource vision and mission here in Greater Portland, and not just build the name above our churches, but build the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Hey, welcome everybody. God is very excited that you're here today. He, he made you for himself after all, and me. I'll include myself in there. Hey, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the Kingdom Impact Fund again. Um, as you know, we're in this month of joyful giving. 10% of everything that we give through this month is going to be given to the Kingdom Impact Fund. Let, let me uh, read this verse to you out of James 2. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The, uh, the neat thing about the Kingdom Impact Fund is that we get to see that happen twice. First of all, as we are open-handed and we are faithful in our giving, that's one time. Then as we give it to other churches, they get to do the same thing with their own human resources, with other things that they blend together. So we get to see the works show themselves twice, and that faith is just uh, so lifted up in that. So that is good news that we get to do that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, the philosophy, again, just overall, what is kingdom impact to everybody here? I see it ultimately is that we bring people into the very presence of God. That's what the, the end game is going to be. And that's what he wants to see. So what might be included in that? I was making a long list of this, so I'm going to shorten that up for you. But first of all, it's just kind of sort of being a catalyst for Kingdom Impact. And that will be where we meet with these other churches and leaders in those churches and say, hey, this is available to you. And now they start to think, oh, we can do something that we've wanted to do before, but we just never really, you know, put the, pushed it on. And so they get to look at it that way. The other thing is that there's going to be a, a diversity, a collaboration um, of, of uh, creativity that will happen when there are more possibilities are opened up. So we look forward to seeing that take place also. And, and who is it for? Well, it's really for Bible-believing churches who embrace Jesus as Lord and are held back because of their lack of resources. So they're people who are like-minded with us. Those are the people who are going to do it. And we've been working on the processes of this, the, from awareness to application process to the actual fulfillment process and what that looks like. And we've got a great team that's working together. And our team is actually on the team. We represent three different churches. And so that is great as well, that we get to kind of hear and understand where other people are coming from, and we're going to be kind of accepted even in a greater way as we go out because it's not just one place that's doing this. It actually is the kingdom making a kingdom impact. And then the final thing uh, we want to see is, is the, um, 
that this is a seed, really, what's happening in December. This is just the start of it. We want to see this perpetuate, and that's going to happen through our tithes and offerings year after year as it go out, goes on, but as well as these other churches that we're participating with, we're hoping that they come on board as well and just see this spread throughout the state as much as possible. So we've got three ways to give here at East Point. We can give online, we can give with the giving app, and we can uh, give with the giving boxes in the back. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you. I thank you for bringing us here. I thank you for all the opportunities you give us. I thank you for your son in us, the hope of glory. That's what gives us our joy. Father, so we just pray that you take what you've given to us and you just multiply it in ways that will just uh, astonish us, Father. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Hey, we're going to stand up. Go ahead. We're going to stand up and uh, ask, ask the folks around you, where does their joy come from? You've got a few minutes for that. Hey, good morning, church family. How are we today? Good to see you all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hey, I've only got two hours. Let's get going. Hey, it's so good to see you all. I just have to share, I'm a little sore this morning. I may have taken the most epic wipeout on that turf playing kickball on Friday night. So if I'm hobbling around... Just know that I did score. It was an inside the park home run. I made it. But my knee took a beating in the process. Hey, I'm just so glad to be here today as stiff as I might be. I'm not like 18 or 20 anymore. Trying to run is so hard. And I know I'm young, right? And I'm like, oh man. Well, so we're gonna, we're gonna stretch out together a little bit today. One thing I want to highlight as we talk through joyful giving, I want to make it abundantly clear that joyful giving is a season of generosity, first and foremost, that we do to glorify Jesus, right? That we give because we've received. We give back to God. It's just a return. We just like, God calls us to give generously. The tithe is this 10%, and we take that model right out of the scriptures and apply it to ourselves corporately. God, we want to give 10% away of all that we receive. So we want to glorify Jesus. We also want to bless Greater Portland. We don't want to keep it for ourselves. We want to be able to inject it and and make an impact here in Greater Portland. And also, the third aspect is so we start the first year well, or the first of the year really well. First quarter is always historically a little difficult financially. It's always a, a little tight. People are trying to 
get an understanding of what 2024 is going to look like. I was sitting with friends last night for dinner, and one of my friends shared that there's a meme out there that said, hey, 2024, we see you coming. I want to know the terms and conditions this year. <laughs> right? We always, we're looking at the new year, so just know that joyful giving is that time that sets us up really well to continue our impact into the year. And so joyful giving is not just simply we're giving 10% to the Kingdom Impact Fund. 90% goes to help support what we do here at the church in increasing our impact. Because ultimately, we have a mission. And maybe this is your first time here. This is your first Sunday. Maybe you came to Jingle Jam Thursday night and you're like, this is a church? What is this place? Or maybe you've been here for 19 and a half years since the beginning. Our mission has never changed. We're here to make disciples. We're here to make disciples of Jesus who share him with others. And disciples aren't simply attenders. They're not consumers. They're followers. They're students. They're practitioners. And as we make disciples, his kingdom goes into the region, right? It's not about having as many people in one room as possible. It's as many people in this room going out as disciples as possible. And so that's our heartbeat. That's who we are. And that's why we're leaning in because we are on mission to make disciples of Jesus who share him with others here in greater Portland. It's so near to my heart and it's so near to Jesus' heart. He talks about it all through the gospels. It's so near to the, the heart of the scriptures and Holy Spirit makes it so clear through all of the scriptures that this is about making disciples, true followers, students, practitioners of the ways of Jesus. And so if you're here with us this morning, that's what we're about. We are unashamedly about following Jesus because we know he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he brings life and life abundant. So no matter the terms and conditions of 2024, we're making disciples. No matter what comes our way, we can look back over 23. Too many of you are just ready to rip that calendar off the wall. You've been ready since October. You're like, I want this year to be done. There's still time left. There's still time left to see people's hearts transformed this year by the gospel. Next weekend, next Sunday, uh, December 17th, Matt is going to be finishing up our, our Simple Kingdom series as we finish out Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to invite people to baptism. And let me tell you, baptism doesn't save you, but it is an outward confession of an inward decision that Jesus is Lord. Lord. We don't use that word very much these days. Lord. Let's translate it with king. Right? That there is a kingdom and he is king, and we come to him with bowed knee and say, Jesus, you're Lord. That's what baptism is. It's dying to ourselves and being raised to new life. And today, we're going to see that in the text, that there's this invitation that Jesus has that, man, it's going to seem hard, but it's simple. It's going to seem difficult, but it's actually a single way. Right, we're going to see in Matthew chapter 7, as we go through verses 13 and on, we're going to see that Jesus invites us to a narrow way. And it's as wide as one person. It's as wide as himself. That he says, enter through the narrow gate. Narrow is the way. Narrow is the road. But it leads to life. So today we're going to take a journey through the scriptures. We're going to be kind of flying around because I think as I was preparing, there's just so much in the text, so much from the mouth of Jesus, so much from the hand of one of his disciples, his apostles, Paul, that we just need to understand that in this season, this is such an important invitation for the church. It's so important for us that we don't get caught up going down one way or the other, that we're not heading down the broad road, that we're actually finding that narrow gate on a daily basis and saying, Jesus, I'm coming after you. I'm following you because this is the only way that leads to life. I promise you, we promise you as a church, Jesus brings us life and life abundant, but it's only through him. So today, if you have your Bible, get ready because we're going to fly through it. We're going to start in uh, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 13. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. Say that with me. Many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. 
and only a few find it. Say that with me. And only a few find it. So st- statistics play out here. You kind of look around and go, I hope I've found it. Jesus isn't trying to scare us in this passage. He's trying to bring awareness to us, make sure that we're walking through that narrow gate. Right? Because broad is the road. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many head down it. Anyone like thinking about that ACDC song? Highway to Hell? We all chuckle, right? I hope you don't know the lyrics by heart, but many probably do. Doesn't sound like the narrow ways of Jesus, does it? And yet all through the 70s, people sang their guts out about it. As they sing the anthem, heading down the highway to hell. Think about that. Our culture celebrating the very broad road that Jesus is saying, don't go down that. It's dark, it's painful, and it's eternal. And yet as a culture, we're celebrating with ACDC and all of their spirituality. (laughs) Singing. Anthem. And Jesus is saying, enter through the narrow gate, church. Enter through the narrow gate. So I just want to highlight that the narrow way, this is, this is not rocket science as we see in this passage, but I think it's important to highlight the narrow way is an all-inclusive invitation to an exclusive way. Right? Many people, their wrestling match with Jesus is the fact that he comes out and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. People go, oh, what, Jesus thinks he's the only one? Yeah, he does. And he's the only one that's risen from the grave. But Jesus makes this all-inclusive invitation. Right? In Galatians chapter 5, let me, let me read it real quick. That Jesus tells us, so in Christ, or this is what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. But for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. And what Paul's writing is that Jesus' invitation is all-inclusive. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter your lineage. It doesn't matter your mistakes, your sins. It doesn't matter if you're from Ashland or Buckfield. It doesn't matter. (laughs) It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter. All that matters is you accept the exclusive way. Many of us will think, man, all people go to heaven, right? Jesus will tell us something different. Jesus makes it clear something very different. Jesus has come through me and you experience eternal life. But apart from that narrow gate, apart from that narrow way, we're on the broad road that leads to destruction. That's hard. That's a hard teaching. That's hard to reconcile with. We have loved ones in our lives Many of us, probably all of us, have people in our lives that have not declared that Jesus is Lord, have not, have not come to understand His grace and His mercy and what He's done for us through the cross. And it should make us grieve. It should make us weep to know that we have loved ones that apart from Jesus, they're destined to that eternal destruction. And yet Jesus is saying, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Why do we celebrate Christmas if he's not? If he's just another prophet, if he's just another mystic, if he's just another good guy, why would we set our entire calendars around Christmas? Because he's not just another good teacher. He's not just another prophet. He's the Messiah that has come to show us the way to his Father in heaven. He's the one that's brought us the true hope and peace and joy that we love celebrating on Christmas. But apart from him, we can't enjoy those heavenly riches because he's saying, I'm the only way. You've got to enter through the narrow gate. You've got to journey down that narrow way. And he assures us it leads to life. You know, even Peter in Acts chapter 4 
He says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The exclusivity of Jesus is one of the greatest stumbling blocks of our culture. Because we're far too rational, far too intellectual, far too enlightened to bend our knee. The lordship of Jesus is the pathway, is the narrow gate to enter this abundant life. Again, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, oh, man. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It's this invitation to knowing him, right? And many of us, we're looking for that narrow gate. We're like, we need an exit strategy because this this broad road that leads to destruction, it's a whole lot like a slip and slide with Dawn dish soap on it. Once you get on it, you're not getting off, right? We clamor and we try to find in the chaotic moments of life that narrow gate because we just need relief from our situation. But how many of us put our hand on that door, we're about to step through and we go, that was pretty fun actually. I kind of enjoyed that. Seems like this narrow gate feels a little restrictive. It seems like it's a little hard to enter through. Seems like a lot of my friends aren't going down this way. Though it looks good as I look in, maybe it's not time. And man, I'm telling you, Jesus, like we saw, like we read last week, when as we're as he's inviting us to ask and seek and knock, he's knocking at our door. He's knocking at our door saying, here's the gate. Here's the narrow way. It's here for you. It's available to you. It's available for every single person in this room. And he's saying, not just so that you get your ticket to punch it and go to heaven, so that you know my Father in heaven who knit you, who made you, who ordained every day in your life, who loves you so much that he'd send his son. He says, enter through the narrow gate. And we're going to see as we go through the passage that this narrow gate isn't simply like finding the secret door, right? It's not like finding the wardrobe to get into Narnia. It's like, oh, guys, look what I found. No, this narrow gate, it's like seeing the daylight through the crushing rocks and crags as you're climbing a mountain. And you, gotta, you know, that's where I've got to go. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be painful, maybe. It's going to be crushing. You're going to have to squeeze. You can't take your baggage And Jesus is saying, come on, come through the narrow gate. Come step onto the road. It's going to lead to life, but I'm not going to leave you the way I found you. Jesus is not going to leave us the way he finds us. As we walk in here, we are so welcome to come as we are, but man, do I appeal. Please don't leave as you came. Jesus is saying the same thing here. I have work to be done in you the way that you were meant to be made. I'm going to do that here on earth in and through your heart, your soul, your mind. So this joy and hope and peace of this season actually blossom from within. But you got to come through the narrow gate. And there's, there's a, a warning that Jesus gives us here in Matthew chapter 7 that ties right into this, right? We're, we're heading down this broad road that leads to destruction. We find this narrow gate, and, and Jesus calls out a dynamic that happens as we're wrestling through these two decisions. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. It sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. Every every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Man, we got to take that with us as we leave today. It's by their fruit you will recognize them. Right? As, as, as we're heading down this, this broad road or we're making, this, we're making this hard right into the ways of Jesus, there are people on the path that are going to celebrate you parading down the broad road with the mob. Keep going. This is good. You'll enjoy it. You'll love it. Anyone ever been in those big, like, mad rush, like, 10 a.m. walks into, like, Disneyland? 
And you're just like, I, I have no choice. I'm going to get trampled on if I try to turn around. Right? People are just moving. You got the Mickey Mouse ears and the t-shirts, 50 years at Disney, right? It's like everyone's so excited to get into Disney World. You're going to love it. And you've got these people just waving you in, waving you in. And you're in this crowd and this mob. And someone says, hey, life is actually over here. And you see and you look, but you can't get to them because so many people are just moving you forward. There's prophets, there's people declaring, this is the way to go. You're going to love the rides. And they're saying, hey, come on over here. This is where true life is. When all of this disappears, what's going to be left? There is life. And we have to make our way through the crowd. We have to reach for hands. We have to get pulled through to fight the forces that are pushing us down this broad road. And there are people that will cheer you on down that road. Here's the scary thing. These false prophets exist not only today in the 21st century, they exist within the church right now. That there are people within the church that look like sheep, but they're actually wolves. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And they're ferocious. And they get in the pasture and they deceive and they, they harass and they go after the sheep and they try to lead them astray. Right? They come under the guise of, of, of righteousness or, or love or social justice or, or just pounding, pounding down the doors of God and country and all these things. But at the middle of it, there is no gospel that Jesus has come to die for us so that we might live for him. He's come so that we might be transformed by his spirit, so we no longer live the lives we used to live. Right? There's three categories that just came to mind as I was, I was preparing, and, and two of them are actually within the church. We have the progressives that are influencing people, that are affirming sin that is damaging for our soul. It's damaging for the body, that they're, they're encouraging it with an empty type of love, with a, I don't want to hurt your feelings, so I'm not going to share truth to you. Jesus Christ came in both grace and truth. Because he knew our corrupt condition. He knew our propensities. He knew that we would go for things that weren't good for us. And yet the progressives continue to move on in this, in this social justice agenda. And it's leading hundreds of thousands of people astray. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms us more into his likeness. Holiness. Purity. We see fruit bear in our lives. And on the other side, we have, we have this nationalistic gospel that we hold high, the scriptures and the constitution, as if they're both inspired words of God. There is only one inspired word of God, let me tell you, and it is the scriptures. Now, we're a country founded on Judeo-Christian values. Of course we are, but we can't, we can't mix up our citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. Jesus is our king we have no other authority other than the authority that God has allowed us to live under. We need to, be, we need to be just respectful and leave quiet, humble lives. Do we sit back as there's injustices around us? Of course not. Do we walk with conviction, walking with Jesus? That's our call. But at the end of the day, our Savior, he went up Calvary and died on a crucifix. He looked at Peter as he was about to pull the sword and he said, she, that sword. Peter himself went to the crucifix upside down. Paul wrote most of the New Testament epistles from a prison cell. Jesus says, come follow me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We can't get caught up as a church in some of these things that lead us to the fruit that we're going to see, the fruit that comes from the flesh. It's the gospel that's going to transform lives. The narrow gate is exclusively the invitation of Jesus. But there's these prophets, these false prophets that'll herald us down the broad road. They'll send us down, encouraging us, continue on with the mobs as hundreds of thousands of Christians are led astray because of things here on earth. And Jesus is saying, get your eyes on the eternal. Get your eyes on your true citizenship. Get your hands in my hand. Walk with me. Know me because fruit bears as you remain in me. And there's a third influence here, just in this region, and it's really actually unique to a couple spots in the country. And, and right now, we're seeing more people delivered and saved out of the New Age movement than ever before in the history of the church. People who've come 
to, to understand and adopt some of the New Age mysticism and some of these, these things like Ouija board and the occult and tarot cards and Reiki and all of these things that we all think are these incredible neutral spiritual experiences. Let me tell you, they are not neutral. They're not. There's people in this church that they want to scream at the top of their lungs because they say, don't live into the lies. I've been held captive and troubled and, and tormented. And, and it's this lie of selfishness and self-centeredness and all these experiences. And it leaves you empty, broken, and discontent. And Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. Come walk with me. There's so many things in this life, if we allow them, they're going to lead us down that broad road. But we have to tune our ears in church to listen for the still small voice that says, come to me. Come to me. Walk with me. Life is found in me and me alone. Jesus is inviting us into this place of deep, deep intimacy. The narrow way is where Jesus takes us from destruction and leads us toward life. And if you're like me, you're living maybe a life of destruction and you think it's great, right? I've been there. I'm like, I've got everything I need. I've got the world at my fingertips. And Jesus had to convict my heart, and I'll share it in a moment. Keenan, you don't understand how broken you truly are. And so we're going to take a look at fruit, right? Jesus, is, Jesus tells us we're going to know them by their fruit. So in Galatians chapter 5, Paul actually lines out fruit for us. And I'm not talking apples and oranges and bananas, right? I'm not talking these things that we often try to, try to grab hold of that are tangible, right? We look at fruit, and especially in our culture, in a Western culture, we think of fruit as results, right? We go, oh, full auditorium. I've got all these things stacked up. Look at what I've done. Look at the, the things that I've, that I've communicated. All these things are just results, and that is not the fruit that Jesus is focusing on. When he says, you look at these, these false prophets or you look at your own life, this is the fruit in Galatians chapter five he wants us to focus on. But we have to understand that there is a fruit that reveals to us when we're not walking with Jesus. So in Galatians chapter five and verse 19, Paul writes that the acts of the flesh are obvious. We're calling this the fruit of the flesh. Sexual immorality. That's, Physical intimacy outside of the context of marriage between a man and a woman. Anything outside of that. Paul, Jesus, the scriptures, they teach us that that is immorality. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warned you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty bad fruit, huh? Seems like thistles and thorn bushes. And yet Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. It's peace. It's forbearance or patience. It's kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, oh, we can't miss this, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The narrow way yields kingdom fruit by putting to death our flesh. This fruit, we're like, oh, but where's the result? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is the fruit. That is the eternal life that the Holy Spirit wants to bear in us. That this watching world is going to say, I recognize them. They must be followers of Jesus. And how many of us would want to do a fruit assessment right now? I wouldn't. Right? You look at your life and you're like, man, there might be a little more selfish ambition than I care to admit. I might cause some discord in my life a little more often than I'd care to admit. 
My relationships might not be right in my life, and I don't really care to admit that. Out of all of that, does that bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? Or does it, does it have this anxiety and this, this anger and this, this strife that goes on in our lives because we know we're living in, in conflict between the invitation Jesus has for us to enter his narrow way or the broad road that leads to destruction? Paul says these acts of the flesh, this is what we live into. We don't inherit the kingdom of God. Man, does it sound exclusive. This is why Jesus came for us. Sometimes the gospel, the good news of Jesus, has to carry some weight, doesn't it? We have to realize, apart from Jesus, we truly can do nothing. Apart from his love, apart from his mercy, apart from his, his entering our lives and waking us up and saying, Keenan, you don't realize you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Right? There was a time in my life where I could have checked off every single one of those almost. Not witchcraft. I avoided that. <laughs> Sexual morality, debauchery, drunkenness, selfish ambition. Check, 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 check. And it took a dramatic, desperate moment in my life for Jesus to show up in my bedroom and say, enter through the narrow gate. Because you're on a broad road, Keenan, that leads to destruction. I lost my best friend years ago, and I found myself, after the memorial service, in a complete stupor with all of my buddies. We, we celebrated his life by going to the bars. And when I woke up that morning, all I knew was destruction in my life. All I knew was I needed to make my heart right. This is not the ways of Jesus. And so there I was in Otisfield, Maine, above the garage, near my bedside, and my knee hit the floor for the first time before Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And everything changed, right? Then the work began. Jesus' invitation to the narrow gate is not simply step through the threshold and everything's okay. He says, follow the narrow way. The way is narrow, but it leads to life. And too many of us stay just on the other side of that threshold. And we say, Jesus, we're going to watch the rest of y'all follow. All you guys follow Jesus, and we're going to stay right here. And Jesus is saying, come further down the narrow way. Come further down. It's leading to life. This is the process of sanctification. This is the process of allowing the cross of Christ Jesus to crucify the inner person in us so that he might bear fruit through us but we need to go through the pruning. We need to go through the cross. We need to go through the gate. We need to allow Jesus to do the work in us so that when he finds us, we're no longer the same person after he rescues us. And it's only by his spirit. Many of us have had those moments reflecting back maybe a decade or so going, man, if you would have only seen who I was. Was the journey easy? There were relationships, there were habits, there were impulses, there were desires, I'm sure, that you had to lay down before Jesus. And to say, if I pick this back up, I'm right back on that broad road. I'm right back to bearing that bad fruit. Jesus in John chapter 15, he tells us, he says, I'm the vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. Man, think about that. That even the branches that do bear some fruit, he prunes so they're more fruitful. We're already clean. We're already welcomed in. We're already grafted into the vine that he is. But his father continues to go through our lives. The father who loves us, that wants to continue to reform and redeem us into the way that we were made. He says, I'm going to prune. And I'm going to work. And I'm going to get rid of those things in your life that bear bad fruit. I'm going to clean these things up because I want you to be flourishing I want my church to be flourishing so that the world will know that my son was set. That it's our witness. It's the fruit bearing in our lives that Jesus is saying, you have to pay attention. 
When we listen to those voices in our head that sound so good, that are leading us down that broad road of destruction, do we look at them and say they're right? Or do we look at them and say the fruit is bearing in their life? They're marked with love and joy. Unending, never ceasing joy. They're marked with grace and gentleness and mercy and faithfulness. Self-control. You'll know a tree by its fruit. Jesus says, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. All of these texts, all of the scripture is this invitation from a holy God to his children to say, just come walk with me. I'll take care of everything. We look at this text on the narrow, the narrow gate, the narrow road, and we say, that sounds hard. We contrast it with Jesus' invitation in Matthew chapter 11 to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, right? It's easy. My burden's light. And we go, how do we reconcile these, Keenan? The hard, narrow, difficult road and the easy, light burden of Jesus. One common invitation. Come to me. Learn from me. Jesus will take care of it. But he does tell us, whoever wants to be my disciple, that's our mission. We're making disciples here. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, must bend their knee, take up their cross, and follow me. That's Jesus' invitation to each and every one of us. If we consider ourselves followers, to look at our lives, to look at the fruit bearing in our lives, to take a 360 degree assessment and say, is the kingdom of God, the fruit that comes from the kingdom of God, is it bearing in my life? And if it's not, maybe I should let the Father do some pruning. Because I want to deny myself. I want to pick up my cross. And I want to follow Jesus because he is the only way, the exclusive way, the one and only one that has come to bring us life and life eternal. You see, that narrow way, like I said earlier, is as wide as Jesus. If you picture it, it's as wide as Jesus with his hands on the cross looking down upon the few disciples and the few women that stood there at the cross, that's as wide as that narrow gate. And he says, you get to walk through it with me. He went before us. We were his joy. And he endured the cross so you and I could walk through that narrow gate. We could be pulled off of that broad road that leads to destruction. He could say, come walk with me. I have life for you. Life you know nothing about. Streams of living water. Bread of life. Life eternal with my Father. He loves you and he's coming for you. But you have to come through me. Who are we to say, no, Jesus, sounds a little too exclusive. It's the most inclusive invitation that has ever been given by any religious prophet in the history of mankind. But it's the most exclusive way because Jesus said, you don't, it's not about scales balancing. It's not about good deeds versus bad deeds. It's not about good karma or anything else like that. It's about, do you know me? Will you walk with me? Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, but in me you will bear fruit. And so our invitation this morning is to reflect on a few things. We're going to ask Holy Spirit to do the work today because only He knows what's going on inside of you and me. Right? So we have an exercise at the top. These are just to ask Him. Let Him do the work. What's keeping me from entering through the narrow gate this morning, Jesus? What's keeping me? What am I holding on to? Because so many of us, we have these, this baggage and these things we want to take with us. And he's like, you can only fit. There's no check bags at this terminal. Come on through, but you got to leave it. What pruning do you desire to do in my life? 
These are hard questions. These are meant to be hard. Jesus is looking at this audience behind the disciples and he's declaring his way into the kingdom. And he's saying, this is gonna be about following me, knowing me, walking with me, putting our hand in his, getting in the word, being in community, allowing him to do the work by his spirit in our lives. And this is his invitation to us. So we can leave that slide up on the screen. I just wanna give us a couple minutes as we go into a reflection for communion to really ask Holy Spirit, What is keeping me from entering through that narrow gate and journeying down the road that leads to life? And what pruning do you desire to do in my life? What things do you desire to clip and cut so that I could bear more fruit here on earth? If you would just bow your head with me, we're gonna go through a prayer exercise as we ask ourselves those questions. Father, we invite your spirit to do what only he can. Paul tells us that We allow the the cross to crucify our flesh so that way we can walk and stay and step with you, Holy Spirit. And so, Father, that's, we're coming to you. Holy Spirit, we're coming to you. Jesus, we we just want to walk through this narrow way. We want to walk into your kingdom. We want to know that we're bearing the fruit that you desire in our lives. So, Father, bring the conviction that only you can, that leads to transformation, that leads to renewal. Oh, Jesus. We give ourselves over to you for the next few minutes to allow you to work in our lives. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. If you hear from him this morning, what a gift. If you feel that nudge in your heart, if you feel that conviction in your soul, what a gift that we have a Father in heaven who loves us. What a gift that we have a Father who wants to transform us into the image of his Son. What a gift that he's not done with us. Amen. God continues to reveal in me, continues to work in me, continues to reveal in us and work in us that we aren't left as we're found. That as we take his hand and we go down this narrow, narrow way, he's going to lead us to life and life abundant. He promises. And that night before he was crucified, he sat there with his disciples years after the Sermon on the Mount. He sums it all up. He says, love one another as I have loved you. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. He says, love one another. The way you engage one another, the way you love one another, if you are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, love one another. It is this. This is how the world will know that Jesus Christ was sent by the way we love one another, by the fruit that bears in our lives as we follow him together. And then he takes the bread and the wine And he shows us how he would love us, that he would lay his life down for us. That he would go to the cross, he would hang from the cross, he would die a death of a criminal, paying for our sin, paying for our brokenness, opening that narrow gate so that we could have life with him, with his Father in heaven. We take the bread, recognizing it was his body broken for you and for me on that cross. And the cup, oh, the cup of the new covenant. His blood poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sin, washing us clean, white as snow, transforming our lives. He's saying, take and drink. This is my blood, the cup of the new covenant. We take and drink together. Jesus, we come to you as you knock on the door. As you stand at that door and knock, 
We recognize that it's you, Jesus, that your invitation is not simply to just go through another checkpoint, but your invitation is to walk the journey that leads to life. And, and Jesus, though, this is, seems so hard. You're so willing to walk with us. You're willing to walk with your disciples. You walked by your spirit with your early church. You've walked through the centuries and the millennia with your church to ensure that we are on the way and the path to life. You say, whoever remains in me, I will remain in them. And so Jesus, we receive you this morning. We receive your life. We receive your goodness. We receive your mercy. We receive you, Jesus in a new way this morning, knowing that it's only in and through you that we can find the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, we love you. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as you're able as we worship to close.
Praise God. Hey, look, one thing I just wanted to highlight is we have our Christmas invitations. So if you'd like to grab a few of these, invite some people to our Christmas services on Saturday at 6 p.m. on Saturday the 23rd and on Sunday at 3 and 5. We'd love to have uh, people join us to celebrate Christmas on this holy night. I also want to put this slide back up there. A few things that are coming up. One is next week with baptism. If you want to be baptized, if you're like, I'm ready to enter that narrow gate. I'm ready to go down that journey with Jesus. I'm finally ready. We are ready for you as well. You can either catch us in Discovery East Point after the service or next week just show up ready with a heart ready to receive Jesus. We'll make that super clear for you. And also a couple things. So we're going to do a little New Year's Eve uh, gathering here on Sunday evening on the 31st. It's not going to be crazy. If anybody wants to start the New Year's with us in prayer and worship, it'll be 6 to midnight. Oh, wow. Right. Well. <laughs> but just a few of us are getting together. We want to make an invitation to the church family. If you want to gather in that way, we'll be probably in the student lounge. More details to come. And we're also setting our hearts ready to just get hungry for the person and presence of Jesus in the first year. So we're anticipating a 21-day fast and prayer uh, movement going in the first of the year. For some people, it's like, what does that mean? We're going to help understand this. We're going to do it as a church family. It's an invitation. It is not something that is exclusive or a must. But if you want to set your heart right, if you want to get before Jesus and, and understand fasting and prayer as a church family, we'll have plenty of resources. So just let that settle in your heart and see if that's something that you want to be part of as we go into the first of the year. Otherwise, I pray that if you just hear Jesus knocking on that door, if you just find that narrow gate, man, take him up. Walk with him. Experience the life he has for you because I promise it is abundant and the fruit will bear as a result. Amen? Hey, have a great Sunday afternoon. We'll see you next week.